I introduced myself downstairs, so I'll keep this short. The big thing is, you know, I try to come to these events not to run through a bunch of PowerPoint, to really take the next step in our trying to strike a deeper relationship so that we actually learn about the problems that are unique to you. So we don't want to just be throwing technology at you. And when we look at the past, and it was pretty known for this across the mainframe software environment, that we would build something, throw it at you, and then see what worked. And then we'll throw something again at you, and you had to figure out how to actually bring it all together. So a lot of the strategy you're going to see here is how we're bringing it together, how we're taking an API-first approach, how we're sharing that across platforms so that it's not mainframe for mainframe's sake, that we bring the mainframe in as a critical part of hybrid IT. But the only way we continue to do that is if we continue to work with you very tightly. So we have a design thinking uh, workshop where we do it with our customers. We have one where we do it internally, and then we work with you as sponsor customers. We bring folks into our validation programs and do continuous sprint reviews and then solution demos at the end. Whatever makes the most sense for you and your team. So I throw that out there. If that's of interest or you have questions or you want to follow up around roadmaps, you know, meet us downstairs at the, table, at the Broadcom table downstairs, and we can certainly sign up for that and make sure that you actually get that deeper dive and your teams get integrated in. Let's get into it. So, for those of the folks in this room, this is probably not new news. But it continues to surprise me when we're bringing associate engineers in out of university that people don't really realize that the mainframe's behind two thirds of the workload that are actually out there. That almost all the banks use the mainframe. Almost every time you swipe that credit card or use that ATM machine, it goes back and touches the mainframe. We've modernized a lot of those interfaces so that you do banking on your phone. We leverage our mobile phones for just about everything. But how that integrates in, how we make sure that we take advantage for the right platform, for the right applications, we leverage the qualities of service of, say, the mainframe around security, around transactional processing in unique strategic ways, but we don't make it isolated. We find a way to bring it into the DevOps fold. Those are a lot of the areas that we're going to talk about here. And the hardware box itself, I mean, I use the analogy downstairs of like several of the cars, and we're going to get into that on our balanced investment as well. I mean, the hardware hasn't stood still either. Tarun's going to, from IBM, is going to talk about that with me here on stage because it's important that we manage this as an open ecosystem. This is not just an IBM box with one or two vendors on it. It's a vibrant ecosystem, and we're driving some of the same investments that you've seen from the distributed world in the open. So the open mainframe project and some of the work that we've done there. But you continue to see investments like pervasive encryption. I mean, the mainframe has been and continues to be the most secure platform. Is it open up to new threats? Of course. I mean, you basically have hybrid IT tapping it all the time. But it's still the most secure platform. It still has the transactional volume capability that none others have. And that real-time machine learning, how we leverage it in incremental ways like we just talked about to tie to automation, is absolutely critical both from our skills standpoint as well as just understanding, man, we put all this data on the machine. Either the operating system is dumping data through SMF records or we as vendors are dumping data through logs. How do we just use it better? It doesn't have to be that complex. There's a lot we can do with what we already put out there. So we'll get into how we're doing that. When I look at the main challenges, what I'm hearing from you all, what I'm hearing from uh, the, the companies that we're working with, kind of falls into three main categories. From a process standpoint, we can't just keep doing things the old way. We talked about that again downstairs. You heard that from some of the guest speakers on how we're trying to change this. One of the things that I found in my CA and my previous IBM days is the mainframe budget is the single biggest budget. It was for us. It is for most of our vendors. So obviously, there's a big bullseye on it. So how do we help you do more with less and not just the PowerPoint buzzword? How do we actually use the data to better inform us on where are we not really leveraging the white space that's out there? How do we make sure that we tie to those SLAs? Not all SLAs need to be met if it's really costly. So how do we bring that intelligence from the people perspective and from a process as well? And when you look at the people, a lot of us are a little older than some of the folks we're hiring in from out of the university. I think 7%, if I remember the latest numbers, are the ones that are coming out of university and about 
30-ish percent are those, you know, from a, over 60. The benefit is over the last couple of years, that's gotten better. And that middle spot right around 40, that sweet spot, that's vibrant. So how do we make sure that we take the SME skills and we augment that machine learning, that intelligence, and bring it back into the system? While we as vendors, we have a responsibility. We need to help make sure that we can show new people can learn this platform. And we don't have to make it so difficult. But continue the investment in what those of us that have grown up on the mainframe know and love. So that's a lot of the balanced focus that we'll talk about here. Now, one of the unique things that we're doing with Broadcom that Henry talked about a little bit when he had the mainframe uh, chart up there was we know that's difficult for some of you. We know that's an investment that you may not have. I mean, he talked about how Hawk is giving us the two for one backfill. I mean, when we went in there with our growth case, it was amazing. At the end of it, and there's a growth case on the mainframe. I mean, I haven't seen this kind of investment in decades from anybody. And he said, Henry said, you know, double digits. We have 250 plus recs open through LinkedIn right now. So ask anybody else whether they're investing like that. And the key with that is not just how are we bringing people in to learn our products, but we're also doing things like a vitality program where we're working with customers like you and we're saying we know some of our products, like say our database products, IDMS, Datacom, or even you know, our, our DevOps products like Endeavor, big market leading install bases. But they've been around for a while and people are losing some of the skills, retiring out of the market, et cetera. <coughs> So what we're doing, and one of the pilots we have going on right now, specifically focusing on databases to start with, is we'll hire the person in, we'll do the training around the mainframe, we'll do the training about being a DBA, and then we'll put them sitting next to one of your folks, we'll pay for it, and at the end of the year, if you all want to hire them, great. That's the way we set it up when we had the conversation with them initially. What we're finding is, in some instances, we just need to show that it's possible so that you within your teams and you within your you know, management structure can say, I didn't have to spend, I didn't have to risk my budget on it or get your approval to hire. This is what Broadcom did with me. Now see how it worked. So if anybody's interested in that kind of a vitality program, we're starting with databases because we heard that pain, but we're certainly opening that up to things like security, things like DevOps as well, where we can bring in people from your group and help train them consistently side by side with our associate engineers we're hiring as well. And then the last one is around tools. I mean, everybody talks about, we heard again this morning one of the questions about COBOL around some of the, the more legacy uh, programming languages. Man, there's more COBOL being built every day. It's not just legacy. Now, there's a lot of legacy out there as well. But even when you talk to like the <coughs> foresters, the gartners, they're changing the way they look at it. The latest paper that they put out was, you need to carefully weigh. Gartner just put out a paper about needing to carefully weigh. And IBM and uh, Broadcom have been working with IDC to do a similar type of, how do you leverage that mainframe in your hybrid IT environment? So carefully weigh when to use it and when it might be the right case to be able to move some work off of it or to modernize some of those applications. But don't waste money simply because you're on this modernization kick. Figure out what makes sense. So we're all moving towards that. They've changed the way that they talk about it to traditional IT versus legacy IT. Now, how much does a word really matter? But anything that was done yesterday is legacy, right? So it's really just how do we leverage it to the strategic uh, benefits and what we can get out of it. So I talk about balance, and I'll go back to this car analogy. So when you look at any car manufacturer, in this case it's GM, but we've used Honda before, we've used Ford before. No offense if you're a Mustang guy or gal instead of a Corvette guy or gal. My GM just happens to own a couple of Corvettes, so we use Corvettes. But the investment that GM's making, that tried and true SUV, it's got a different use case than what they're trying to sell and the people, the personas they're focused on for the Corvette. But those latest and greatest innovations that are coming through the Corvette, they learn from that use case, they learn from that persona, and then they see how they leverage it in other places. You see the same thing with Honda and the race cars. 
I mean, we all leverage areas where we're doing innovation and then pull it back into how do we make sure that the tried and true traditional systems that you all have invested with us or IBM or others continue to actually move forward as well. So that's what I mean by balance. I'll give you an example here. So we've got the modernize column and we've got the innovate column. And basically we focus on three key areas. And this isn't whether it's, mod, it's ES systems or enterprise systems or mainframe. This is across you know, what we're doing with Broadcom infrastructure software. So first is DevOps and application development. We've got market leading products like Endeavor out there today. So in order for your investments in something like Endeavor to make sense, we need to make sure that they continuously are modernized. Well, if you look at any of the studies, we see most people coming out of university are putting their code in Git. Okay, no reason to fight that. That's a good thing for us. So we made the integration so that if you put it in Git, it stays in sync with what's Endeavor. So if you have teams collaborating, and some of them have been using Endeavor for years, and some of them are just out of college using Git, it all stays in sync. From an innovation standpoint, we've been working with IBM and Rocket Software and the Open Mainframe Forum and others and uh, customers as well around a project called Zoe. Our initial contribution to that was gonna be a product. It's called BrightSight. Mike was gonna talk about it in more detail, but quite frankly, where it came from was we hired a bunch of associate engineers out of college and then we said, oh, and you need to use these unique development tools and these unique IDEs and these unique test tools and these unique build tools and these unique, and they're like, I've been using Gulp, Jenkins, all these open source programs, I don't wanna learn all that. So instead of spending the time learning all these unique tools that they didn't see as a great addition to their resume, they built a command line language so that they could use Jenkins and manage the build even with the mainframe assets. They made this API mediation layer so that whether it's our stuff tying back to an Endeavor or FileMaster Plus, or whether it's IBM stuff, or whether it's Rocket stuff, or whether it's any other vendor you want to pressure to come join us, we want to do this in the open through open APIs. So that's what we mean by modernize. When I look at the next piece around intelligent operations and management, you heard a little bit about this on the panel just, just recently. For our innovations, we said, when I go into one of these network operating centers, I look up and there's like 30 different monitors on the, on, the, on the screen or on the wall. And some dumb schmuck, not dumb, very smart schmuck, is sitting there or the team is looking at it and saying, what's all that mean? And that blinking red thing over there, that happens every Monday, don't worry about it. And when that person or people start to get to the age of retirement, you can't tra train 30 years of expertise in six months. It's just not possible. So how do we make the machine smarter? So we started with the problem on the mainframe because we saw the skills problem, we saw the root cause analysis problem, we saw the simplification or modernization problem. And we said, well, where do we know best? Performance management was what we knew best. We're the ones dumping the data onto the platform. So we took our SysView product, we took the data, the alerts, the metrics that we were dumping, and we put it into a machine learning algorithm. And out came you know, a baseline. Here's what Monday typically looks like. Tuesday's a little different. I go on the weekend, I run batch, I go overnight, I hit Black Friday, you know, whatever. And then I put the real-time alerts back into it and say, Am I tracking along that normal path? Or does it pop an anomaly? Very easy stuff to get started. That worked really well. The example I, I used in the breakout. So then we put network data in, then we put DB2 data in, then we put SMF data in, then we reached out to our cloud and distributed brethren and say, you guys have application data. And of course, the first response was, we don't need that up on the mainframe. Just dump all your data down to us. We'll take care of it. I'm like, that's not the same use case. You got to do something with it. And oh, by the way, a lot of them were saying, I'm already using Splunk. I'm already using some analytics tool, right? Just dump it down and I'll do the forensics. And it's like, well, if you want to create and maintain all that, sure. But if I know this data better than anybody else because we dumped it there, and I drive some insight out of it first, 
If I federate that insight, won't that be easier? And then I can only share what I know is meaningful. Well, Splunk charges by the amount of data. If you only share 30% of that data, it's cheaper. Some things are just basic. And that's how we got started. Now, I took that same ana anal uh, anomaly detection algorithms and I put it back into our main SysView product, back into our main Netmaster product. You've already paid us for those. Use it. If you want to go further than that and bring these products together, yes, that's when we would look to move towards this operational intelligence cross-platform runs on the mainframe, runs as a virtual software appliance on Zed Linux. This isn't your grandfather's mainframe anymore. It's a microservices-based Docker containerized image. It also runs undistributed, also runs, we had the trial version running in AWS. But we've invested in other areas around the basic tools to modernize to say, look, we know the interface needs to be more user friendly. Look, we know if we can run it on these specialty engines, it's cheaper for you. And then from a security standpoint, we've looked at the same thing. We hear pervasive encryption. Okay, so how do I help manage the data? How do I know where the data is? Some of the product problems we got into that Chip will go into later is a lot of our customers were saying, people have been dumping data off of the mainframe into the cloud for years to test it. It was just cheaper and easier to test it over there. But we have no idea whether there was any PII in there or not. And now I've got these pretty major penalties if I can't be held compliant. So we created data content discovery, keep that data on the mainframe instead of dumping it on the cloud as well. So we can categorize it, we can understand the risk, we can do something about it. While we were doing that, we start looking at the user end, so the data up and the user end. From a user end standpoint, multi-factor authentication. So you just build it into our security managers. When we look at trusted access manager, we link that to what we have in the distributed standpoint. So some of the new innovations as well as tying back to what you've already spent money with us, having that balanced investment. So I talked about each one of these examples as I went through that table, but let me just summarize a couple of these areas and would love to follow up with roadmap sessions with any of you around any of these areas. So security and compliance. I keep wanting to point here. It feels like the screen should be here. <laughs> security and compliance. How do I find it? How do I classify it? How do I protect it? New innovation. Data content discovery. Keep the data on the mainframe, but know when it moves off the mainframe and be able to classify it. Multi-factor authentication. If you already have ACF2 or top secret from us, it's in there. If you happen to run with RACF as well, you can use it for free. If you only use RACF, well, we can do that too. When I look at that beyond Oh, um, multi-factor authentication to access management, we're interested in customers that want to partner with us, partner with us there on that integration cross-platform. That's an area where we would like to get more validation. AI ops, so operational intelligence. How do I bring data from all those different places and start being able to say, it wasn't about can I make a prettier, more modernized performance management screen to plop up with the other 30 in your knock. It was how do I bring all that data together and I understand the relationship between them. I can see the topology of how these work together. I can start getting ahead of the problem so I don't have to wait for the system to fail and then have shorter root time to MTTR, mean time to resolution. I can get to more of a predictive time to avoidance, so PTTA. While I'm also taking those investments and pumping them back into the point products, you may look at that as just my seeding strategy to get you hooked. Yes, that's true. I want to prove it to you with what you've already invested with first so that you will want to invest with us further. I don't want to try to make you make that leap of faith all the time. I want to prove to you with what you've already invested with us first. And then DevOps. So we're gonna talk more about this middle section here. It's an absolute key partnership that we're doing with IBM and Rocket. It's in the open mainframe project. Bright side was what we had invested in in the command line language and the API mediation layer and contributed it into the Zoe project. We expect to do more of that. So any customers that 
work with us around Brightside, everything that we innovate there will either go back into Zoe or some other open source environment. That's whether that's on a six month, nine month, how much innovation do we do we, before we put it back into the community? That's where we need your help. Another call for come validate with us, join us to understand what that balance is. And you'll see the reason why we keep doing these things together, where Tarun's gonna talk from an IBM standpoint, is it's all about the ecosystem. We believe that we're being invested in by Broadcom enough that if we just do it wide open, all API driven, we never have to talk about lock-in again. We just want to move faster than everybody else, together with everybody else. It's good for all of us. But I'm going to link it back to my current products. If you're an Endeavor customer, it's a market-leading product. Of course I'm going to tie it into what we're doing with Brightside. By the way, Brightside won the developer's dozen. It was the winner of the most innovative product. This is not a mainframe oh, contest. This was everybody. These were open source projects. So we're quite proud of that. We're not doing this for mainframe for mainframe's sake. We're doing it so the mainframe can act like any other platform when it comes to data access. So Zoe, open source integration. I'm going to take all of Mike's time, and he's not going to have anything to say again because we do this all the time. But I want to be able to hand off to Tarun because this is the important piece that it's not about Broadcom. It's not about CA. Obviously, it's about you. But the only way that we can prove that is if we act like an ecosystem instead of individual vendors. So let me hand it off. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. Uh, my name is Taran Chopra. I'm the director of uh, IBM Z. We call it offering management, uh, product management. I have the privilege to, to lead uh, the offerings from the hardware side. Uh, previous to this role, I brought uh, Z14 in the marketplace. Uh, so, and I've been in mainframes uh, since college days. So 16 years or so, so I started right out of college and I'm still a mainframe. Well, first, thanks uh, Jeff and the team for the invitation, appreciate it. I was just pinging my bosses and I was saying, it's good to see the love in the air. You know, usually I go into uh, meetings and I get the beatings, uh, but it's, it's good to see uh, some love shown. So that was good. Uh, and, and you know, one of the reasons when I got the invitation, I was very psyched to come here because our partnership with Broadcom is, is, is big, right? Jeff kind of mentioned the pervasive encryption, you know, the ability to encrypt 100% of data with uh, no application changes, no impact to SLAs. When we reach Broadcom, you know, they were, they were just the willing partner. And as Jeff mentioned, day one, they have the support ready because customers like you were asking for that support, right? So, and the Zoe and the the consumption pricing, you know, Broadcom has been big for us, so I wanted to make sure I'm here to show IBM support. I can talk this topic whole day, uh, so I'm not gonna talk. So hopefully somebody gives me the ringer and says my time is up. Uh, but three things I would like to cover as our chairman uses, you know, Ginny, talk about three things. Talk a little bit about the health of the platform quickly, just so that you guys know, you know, it's pretty vibrant. Uh, it's not dying, according to the myths. Uh, second, I wanna spend a few minutes on just how we are seeing the future and what is our roadmap. You know, usually we don't share roadmaps, but this is you know, the new, new drive that we have. I wanted to quickly share with you what we are looking for the next five, 10 years. So we're only working on generations of machines that might come out 10 years from now. So there's a huge investment from IBM to keep the platform going. And then end a little bit on the thoughts on the ecosystem that, that Jeff mentioned. I will be here today, so if you have any questions, you know, please do reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help. Jeff, Jeff just mentioned uh, quickly, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, even our biggest customers, right? Sometimes when I put these stats out there, customers don't know what this is, what it's doing. Even within IBM, IBM is big. Even within IBM, when we talk about mainframe and I put these kind of stats, uh, people's eyes open up, right? The thing that I will mention on the left side, the way we measure our business is the MIPS growth. How much capacity worldwide we have installed. As you can see, over the last 10 years, we have almost 3.5x growth in MIPS. So pretty, pretty healthy business over the last 10 years. And, and the way we have broken it up, uh, on the bottom, you have the traditional MIPS, the capacity. This is like your DB2, ZOS, all those kind of things. And on the top, you see the new workloads. And what I mean by that, the Linux, the Javas, uh, the Spark uh, workloads of the world, right? So, and we are seeing huge growth 
in that echelon. And what that tells me, a couple of things. One, the whole uh, mission statement that we have for this conference, modernize. As customers are modernized, they're putting API wrappers around it, they're converting some of the base stuff to Java. That's where we see huge growth. And second, Linux. Linux on the platform, huge, huge growth. If you haven't looked at Linux on mainframe uh, over the past few years, look again. You know, the savings, the consolidation you can do from your distributed environments and the security aspects of it uh, is a secular combination. And we're seeing that kind of growth worldwide. So the main message of this page is you guys are in a very, very healthy platform as you invest for today and also for the future. Just another question, you know, is mainframe is going to be on the business? Uh, hopefully you've heard the Red Hat acquisition, you know, 30 plus billion dollars we are investing in the second half of this year. But to me, the interesting aspect is we talked today in the panel as well around hybrid cloud. And the possibilities that we see with Red Hat getting acquired and how we integrate or synergize with Red Hat is going to be huge, especially from the hybrid cloud multi-management aspect of the things, right? And second, uh, not sure if you guys saw it, but our announcement with Sam Samsung. Uh, the day technology that we have on the platform is on 14 nanometer from a processor perspective. We're already working with Samsung on seven nanometer. How to bring that on the platform, and I expect the future generation of platform moving to this, uh, to this technology node. So huge, huge investment, billions of dollars of investment that we are putting on to make sure we are ahead of the innovation curve. And then just some of the performance, you know, the Z14 that we launched in 2017 is one of the most successful program that we have launched over the last, I will say, 10, 12 years. Huge, huge acceptance in the marketplace, right? And the ZR1, which is our single frame, or we used to call mid-range, is one of the most successful program on the, on, the, on, the, on the smaller end of the spectrum. And there's some reasons to that that I will touch briefly in the next slide. And where I want to take you for a few minutes is just what we see from a future perspective, right? This is kind of the template that we are using in terms of building the next five, 10 years of the roadmap. I, I'm going to take, go a little bit from the left, uh, from the right to the left, from the bottom, security. Chef talked about it. That's our bread and butter. Uh, we introduced pervasive encryption. We're seeing big adoption in the marketplace. If you haven't used it yet, do it. It's a no-brainer on my end protect all of your data, encrypt all of your data without having those performance and application changes. But we're not stopping here. We're not stopping here. A quantum, for example, on the top right, right? Quantum computing has the potential to break all existing cryptography, right? Now, depending on who you talk to, that can be 10 years, that can be 20 years. But the data that you are cutting today is going to last the 10 years or 15 years. So we can wait to start having innovation 20 years from now to protect the data that is being cut today. So we're already working in the lab in terms of what can we do to safeguard your data from quantum perspective. Your data from encryption perspective, and a lot of customers, Jeff touched on that as well, as your data moves off the platform, how you safeguard it, right? So encryption is good for today, right? For your data that is on the platform, on your storage, but maybe you're moving the data to cloud how you protect that data. We are working on technologies where the protection of Z will flow with your data regardless of wherever it goes. Imagine a world where your data is going on to your third party agency or cloud, but you're rest assured the data is protected with the Z policies. I don't know if recently you heard the FEMA breach that happened where FEMA sent the data to a third party for processing, they were not supposed to send certain pieces of information in that data. They did it, the third party got breached, and all the data is exposed. Now there's no way to bring that data back. There's no way to bring that data back. Now imagine a world tomorrow where you, same use case, you send this part data to your third party, but the data is protected from your host. And you have policies to enforce that, and after maybe some time period, revoke the access as well. Imagine that day you know, where you can do that kind of stuff, right? Analytics, a uh, lot of discussion on AI today. It was good to hear about that, right? Imagine it, you know, what's happening with the AI, which I think is different from the analytics, the base analytics that we do on the platform. The whole notion of AI in my head, I have a master's in data science from Berkeley. 
the whole notion of data, the AI is continuous learning. If you have to have the right AI infrastructure, you have to learn continuously. Now, if you're pumping your data through ETL process to some place, and you do it once a month, or twice a month, or even once every three months, a lot of our customers do that, you can establish the AI infrastructure because that data is old. So there's no point learning from a data that is 60 days stale when the market is moving so fast. So you need to build infrastructure where you're doing that kind of insight as close to the data, as close to the data. That's where the AI value starts to come in. And that's where in my head that is different from a traditional analytics processes that companies have established. So if you are going into that journey, you gotta think through your infrastructure and what makes sense to do the right AI. The Spark architecture, it now gives you the ability to have that federated analytics. The whole machine learning portfolio that we have on Watson runs on Z, runs on your platform. I'll share this with you just, and my time is getting up, but I'll share this with you just to kind of end the discussion a little bit is, this is just, just to show the roadmap where we're heading, right? Z13, we talked a lot about our uh, SMT capabilities that we brought in Linux. On Z14, as I said, the big, big goal was a pervasive encryption. But as I look to the future, right, as I look to the future, what I think is going to happen, right? Uh, as I said, this can change after I'm done talking, so don't take any fixed <laughs> notes, okay? <laughs> so I, I reserve the right to change everything after I'm done with this discussion. But just to leave you with some thoughts, uh, just the big thing, with the single frame, we introduced 19-inch frame. I expect the same thing to happen on our high end. No more unique mainframe hardware from a data center perspective. Uh, we put a, in our single frame storage inside the box uh, to have that data center in a box kind of capabilities, right? Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, as the data leaves the platform, how can we secure it, right? Uh, homomorphic encryption, I don't know if you heard the term homomorphic encryption. Ability to process the data when the data is encrypted no need to decrypt the data. That's the kind of technology we are working on. Now, there's definitely performance impacts to it, uh, but a lot of our customers are saying, look, for very sensitive data, for my crown jewels, I'm ready to take a 10x performance impact. I just don't want to decrypt the data. So that innovation is already working in our research lab, and we're looking into possibilities of bringing into the platform. From a cloud perspective, you know, our ecosystem partner, you know, Broadcom and the company is helping us, but even from our side, our goal is mainframe is a key participant in your cloud strategy, right? That can be your private cloud strategy, modernizing your existing infrastructure from a ZOS perspective. That can be your public cloud strategy where you are leveraging, I don't know if you know, but IBM blockchain. If you go to blockchain for IBM, it runs on the mainframe platform in IBM cloud. It runs, and the reason we picked it because of the security capabilities. Uh, and also on our end, we are, as with uh, Broadcom mentioned, the simplification. We're investing huge amount of dollars and money to simplify the platform. So you're going to see a lot of new innovation in that regard. And finally, ending with me on the, on the Zoe stuff, right? Uh, Jeff touched on it. The way I see Zoe is what we did with Linux, you know, when we launched in 2001 in terms of open ecosystem. Uh, I think that's where we're heading with Zoe from an operational management perspective and Broadcom, thank you for being the, the first sounding father of that effort. And the feedback that we're getting, I, I think Jeff, you would agree, is just amazing from our customers. You know, in, in, within the two months of our launch uh, of the, the base product, I think we have almost 2,000 downloads. Uh, you know, so, so the feedback is just, it's just amazing and I think it removes that barrier. The mainframe is unique. If you have college kids coming in, the look and feel should be just exactly similar to what the kids are doing in college, right? And I strongly believe where we're heading with this thing, this is gonna set the market, but I think it also points to the future innovation we're gonna be doing, and I think what we all realize, and we have to work together very closely to bring the right solutions for you guys, right? So with that, I, I, I went very quickly. If you have more questions on the platform, where we're heading, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you again. What we're doing with DevOps, so transitioning from the Zoe slide, 
and we're gonna dive a little bit into what we're doing around security and compliance. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of what we're doing around operational intelligence because we already had the, the panel before and around automation, but I'm happy to take questions on it. I mean, a lot of what we were doing there was one of the things I first got into with CA like four, uh, 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 four years ago. So happy to take questions on that, happy to actually move it from there. So let me transition over to Mike, and he's going to take us the next level into DevOps.